The 1986 McDonald's All-American team doesn't have many NBA stars, but several players carved out solid careers in the college and pros. That said, there are a few players who, for whatever reason, didn't make the cut in 86. The list of players who didn't make the squad includes nine-time All-Star and Hall of Famer Gary Payton, one-time NBA Steals leader Kendall Gill, one-time All-Star Tyrone Hill, one-time All-Star and 1992 dunk contest champ Cedric Ceballos, and three-time champ Tony Kukoc. However, those guys didn't make the roster, so let's go ahead and take a look at what happened to every McDonald's All-American player from the 86 squad. Ala Abdelnabi. The Alphabet was born in Egypt, but moved to the US when he was two. The 6'10 forward had a star prep campaign which led him to play college ball at Duke. He came off the bench for much of his first three seasons, but broke out as a senior, dropping 15 points and just under seven rebounds a night to make the All-ACC third team. However, his time at school is probably best remembered for when he said, quote, the only way I can make five A's is when I sign my name. Still, the alphabet was picked by the Trailblazers with the 25th pick in the 1990 draft. He spent five years in the NBA, but was traded so often that he was never able to get into a groove. His best run came with the Celtics in 93, when he averaged eight points and five boards in nearly 20 minutes a night. He retired after the 95 season and was asked by the NBA's All-Star Game broadcast team to see if he wanted to work on the Arabic broadcast as the only speaker in the league. He then parlayed that into a career working in broadcast and worked for the 76ers as an analyst as of 2024. Nick Anderson. Anderson attended Simeon Career Academy in Chicago and held the team to a top national ranking as a senior. Notably, he wore the number 25 in honor of former teammate Benji Wilson, who had been shot a few years prior. Anderson continued to wear the number throughout his entire career. For college, he played at Illinois, where he formed the Fly and Illini alongside Kendall Gill, Kenny Battle, Lowell Hamilton, and others. That team made it to the Final Four in 1989, and Anderson decided to head to the NBA right after. He was selected 11th overall by the Expansion Magic that year, which means he was the first pick in franchise history. Anderson was a bucket from the jump, and the Magic slowly built a contender around him, Shaquille O'Neal, and Penny Hardaway. Orlando made it to the 95 Finals, but lost to Akeem Olajuwon's Houston Rockets in a sweep. During Game 1, Anderson bricked four straight free throws that could have won the team a game. That led to fans calling him Nick the Brick. Next year, he injured his wrist in the playoffs and his free throw shooting quickly dropped to around 40% after being relatively reliable to start his career. He'd eventually get back on track, but he never took that step to superstardom. In 99, he was traded to the Kings, who then traded him to the Grizzlies in 2001. He played that final season in Memphis before being cut by the Cavs before the 2003 season could start. It looks like he was working in community relations and broadcast with the Magic as of 2024. Barry Beckadam. Beckadam went to Villanova to play college ball, but didn't see the court much during his time as a Wildcat. He started one game and averaged around eight minutes a night over his career, posting 2.1 points per game. Unsurprisingly, it doesn't look like he was drafted, though he did play for Canada's national team in 1988. After wrapping up his collegiate career, the 6'10 former high school star went into the financial world, where he looks to still be working as of 2024. That said, it does look like he maybe did time in federal prison, so I'm not 100% sure what he's up to. Chris Brooks. Brooks was the first McDonald's All-American to play at West Virginia. He sat out his freshman season, but was an instant star for the Mountaineers when he made it onto the court. Brooks started nearly every game of his four-year career and averaged 14 points and six boards a night. That peaked as a senior when he dropped 17 and eight. It's also worth noting he only took a single three during his entire career, which he made in a game winner against Duquesne in 1990. He played a bit overseas after college, but never made it to the NBA. Sadly, Brooks passed away in 2021. Dwayne Bryant. The six foot two Bryant left New Orleans to attend Georgetown. As a freshman, he started the bulk of the team's games, but was a bit of a shooting liability. That said, his passing skills helped the team to a 29 and five season. The next year, his role was reduced and Bryant responded with a huge turnaround as a junior. He was back in the starting lineup and shooting well. Bryant built on that with an excellent senior season that saw him average 12 points, four boards, six assists, and nearly two steals a night to make the all Big East squad. After wrapping up his career, he got into coaching and works as the athletic director and head basketball coach at a private school in Virginia. Rex Chapman. Chapman's dad, Wayne, played pro ball in the ABA and coached at Kentucky Wesleyan College where he won two Division II national championships. 
While Rex didn't have a great relationship with his dad, he certainly inherited a skill with the ball. He was one of the best recruits in the country during his senior year and decided to stick with Kentucky. As a freshman, he averaged 16 points a night en route to winning SEC Freshman of the Year. He upped his average to 19 a night as a sophomore and led the team to the Sweet 16. While he dropped 30 points against Villanova that night, the Wildcats lost. Chapman decided to head to the NBA after the season, and the expansion Charlotte Hornets made him the 8th pick in the 88 draft, making him the first player selected by that franchise. Chapman averaged 17 a night as a rookie and took part in the 1990 and 91 dunk contests. However, the team decided to trade him to Washington in 92. He was injured to start his time there, but continued to score when healthy. Still, nagging injuries would eventually lead to him being traded to the Heat. Again, injuries derailed production, and Chapman would eventually sign with the Suns. He was still a double-digit scorer when he could get onto the court, but injuries kept hitting and he retired for the 2000 season. Unfortunately, because of those injuries and an appendectomy surgery, Chapman developed an addiction to opioids. He also started to bet on horses daily, but thankfully he would eventually make his way to rehab and cleared himself up. He then worked several jobs around the league and in broadcasting. However, his life started to spiral again around 2010, and Chapman was arrested for shoplifting in 2014. Fortunately, he was able to get help and beat his addictions once again. He's since gone back into broadcasting and released a book in 2024 about his life. Pete Chilcutt Chili Pete went to North Carolina for college ball. The 6'10 forward came off the bench for most of his first two seasons, but became a starter as a junior. By his senior year, he was dropping 12 points and nearly 7 rebounds a night. That was good enough to make the All-ACC third team and get drafted 27th overall by the Kings in the 91 draft. Chili Pete was never an everyday starter, but he did carve out an 8-year career across 7 different teams, winning a title with the Rockets in 1995. After hanging him up, he started teaching 6th grade math and science and founded a basketball academy in California. Derek Coleman Coleman moved to Detroit while growing up and made a name for himself there before joining Syracuse. There, he quickly became a star. Coach Bayheim once said that no player in Syracuse's basketball history had a bigger impact than Coleman, though some might argue for a guy who's going to show up much later on these lists. He made the All-Big East team every year of his collegiate career and won the league's Player of the Year award in 1990. He was also a two-time All-American and set several modern-day records for the Orangemen. Coleman was then selected with the first pick in the 1990 draft by the New Jersey Nets. He immediately proved worth the selection, winning Rookie of the Year while averaging 18 points and 10 boards. His game continued to improve over the next three years and he was named the All-NBA third team in 93 and 94 and made the 94 All-Star team. Unfortunately, injuries and off-the-court issues would derail what could have been a Hall of Fame career. It's not so much that Coleman completely fell off the map, but he didn't live up to his potential over his 15-year career. That said, that kind of longevity is impressive in its own right. Since retiring, Coleman has spent his wealth to help the community of Detroit, notably driving around to help citizens get clean water during the Flint water crisis. He also runs a basketball camp in the area. Phil Henderson Henderson went to Duke for college ball and played sparingly as a freshman. As a sophomore, he played in nearly every game, contributing off the bench for a team that made the Final Four. The next year, Henderson was an everyday starter, averaging 13 points and three boards as the Dukies made a second straight Final Four. As a senior, Henderson took his scoring up to 18.5 a night, and Duke made its third straight Final Four. Unfortunately, he never won a championship. The Mavericks selected him in the second round of the 1990 draft. He never played in the NBA, but did spend several years playing in the CBA. He retired in 1995 and moved to the Philippines to coach youth basketball. Sadly, he passed away in 2013. Steve Hood Hood started his collegiate career at Maryland. As a freshman, he started every game he was healthy for and averaged a hair over 14 points a night. However, during his sophomore year, Tony Massenburg came back into the starting lineup and the team added freshman Bison Dele. Hood's minutes dropped significantly, as did his scoring. At season's end, he transferred to James Madison. One of the big reasons for this is that Hood had been recruited to the Terps by Lefty Drizel, but the coach had resigned following Lynn Bias's unfortunate death. In 88, Lefty had taken over as the head coach at James Madison, and Hood saw an opportunity to play under his preferred coach. He had to sit out a year, but was a star once he got into the squad. He dropped more than 20 points a night during both of his final two seasons, and was named the Coastal Athletic Association Player of the Year in back-to-back -back seasons. Hood was then selected in the second round of the 91 draft by the Kings, but never played in the NBA. He instead went overseas and carved out a long career. He retired for the 2001 season, and I've been unable to find out what he's been up to in the years since. If you know anything, share it below. Ron Heary Heary took his talents to Arkansas for college ball. 
The 6'7 forward was an instant starter, averaging double-digit points from the jump. However, in 88, he ran into some legal issues that led to him being suspended for the season. When he returned, he was one of the better six men in the country, as the team had added a ton of talent and made the Final Four in 1990. He did the same the next year, but the Razorbacks could only make it to the Elite Eight that season. Here he went undrafted, but still has a lasting legacy with Arkansas. His recruitment opened up a pipeline for Arkansas to bring in Memphis players like Corey Beck, Dwight Stewart, and Elmer Martin, who would help the team win the 1994 title. I couldn't find out any info about what he did in the years after, but here he sadly passed away in 2022. Fess Irvin Irvin started his college career at LSU, but playing time proved tough to come by. I haven't found out anything concrete about why he decided to transfer, but I'm assuming it was a lack of minutes and his game not improving with the Tigers. He'd sit out the 89 season and then join Hood at James Madison. Irvin played there for two seasons, averaging double-digit points and starting nearly every game. It looks like he then played overseas for several seasons and is working as a player trainer as of 2024, claiming previous clients like Glenn Davis and Nicholas Batum. Ricky Jones Jones went to Clemson for college but appears to have been hit with an injury or some eligibility issues as a freshman and only suited up for two games using a redshirt season. Over the next three years, he mostly came off the bench and was a rotation player for the Tigers. As a senior in 91, he became an everyday starter, averaging 11 points and 4.5 boards a night. I haven't been able to find out much about his post-playing career outside of knowing his high school retired his jersey in 2022, so if you know more, share it below. Terry Mills Mills joined future pros Glenn Rice and Gary Grant in Michigan. He was a double-digit scorer from the jump and helped Rice lead the Wolverines to a national title win in 1989. With Rice graduating, Mills became one of the leading options in 1990, dropping 18 points and 8 rebounds a night. That summer he signed to play in the Greek League with PAOK, but left the team over a dispute with a head coach. He was then selected 16th overall by the Bucks, who immediately traded him to the Nuggets. He was traded around a few times before signing with the Pistons as a free agent. There, he'd become a double-digit scorer and get his Sugar Brown nickname for his sweet stroke. Despite his height and weight, Mills grew into an excellent three-point shooter with the Pistons, even getting votes for Sixth Man of the Year in 96. After leaving Detroit in 97, he jumped to a few more teams before retiring in 2001. Since then, he spent time in broadcasting and coaching. As of 2024, he's living in Michigan and participates in amateur drag racing. Brian Oliver Oliver joined Georgia Tech for college and got big minutes as a freshman, but was more of a role player to Dwayne Farrell and Tom Hammonds. As a sophomore, he became an everyday starter and dropped 13 points a night. That number went to 16 as a junior and 21 as a senior as he grew into a two-time All-ACC second-teamer. By 1990, Oliver, Dennis Scott, and Kenny Anderson had formed the Lethal Weapon 3 trio and led the Yellow Jackets to the 1990 Final Four. The 76ers then selected him 32nd overall in that year's draft. Oliver came off the bench for two seasons and then went to the CBA for a few seasons, leading the league in scoring in 94. He'd have a few more NBA stints over the years with Washington and Atlanta, but mostly played his career overseas until retiring in 2007. Oliver has spent some time in broadcasting, and his son, J.P. Tokato, played for North Carolina before becoming a pro player largely overseas. Anthony Pendleton Pendleton's high school team won 63 straight games while he was there, leading many to believe those winning ways would follow him to college. Originally, he was scheduled to attend Iowa and play under George Raveling. However, Raveling left the Hawkeyes and went to USC, so Pendleton followed him. That meant he had to sit out a season before he could start playing for the Trojans. As a sophomore, he mostly came off the bench. He played himself into the starting lineup the next year, averaging 15 points for USC. However, he flunked out of school soon after and left the team. He eventually joined St. Martin's College in NAIA school. It doesn't look like he played pro ball, instead getting to coaching at the youth camp level. Mark Randall Randall played high school ball in Colorado and joined the Kansas Jayhawks for college. He mostly came off the bench as a freshman and took a redshirt season in 88 when Kansas won a title with Danny Manning. With Manning off to the NBA, the 6'8 Randall became a starter, averaging 16 points and 7 rebounds a night. His numbers would hover around those marks over the next two years as Randall made third team All-American in 1990 and first team All-Big 8 in 91. That year, he was selected by the Bulls with the 27th pick in the draft. 
Midway through his rookie season, Randall was waived and picked up by the Timberwolves. The next season, Minnesota traded him to the Pistons. He signed with the Heat in 93, but never played. The next year, he signed with the Nuggets and came off the bench for a handful of games over two seasons. Randall played for a few more years in the CBA before becoming a scout and then assistant coach. As of 2024, he appears to be working as an athletic director out in Colorado while doing some broadcast work on the side. J.R. Reed The MVP of the 1986 McDonald's All-American game and that year's Capital Classic, Reed made his way to North Carolina for college ball and was the ACC Rookie of the Year in 1987, dropping 15 points and 7 boards a night. As a sophomore, he upped those averages to 18 points and 9 rebounds, becoming a consensus All-American. He took part in the 88 Summer Olympics, winning a bronze medal, but followed that up with a relatively disappointing junior season. Reed elected the head of the draft and was selected fifth overall by the Hornets. As a rookie, he was solid, making second team all rookie behind 11 points and 8 rebounds. With the Hornets, those numbers stayed pretty consistent, but then they traded him to the Spurs in 92. He was fine in San Antonio, but he never took that next step. Over those four years with the Spurs, Reed's game slowly fell off due to injuries. He had a slight resurgence in 99, averaging 15 points when he was back with the Hornets, but he got injured and only played 16 games that season. Reed bobbed around for a few more years, finishing his career in Cleveland in 2001. He played for a few more seasons overseas and then got into broadcasting. He jumped into coaching in 2011, most recently working as an assistant at Monmouth until leaving in 2022. Larry Rimbert Rimbert went to UAB for college ball, averaging 9 points and 5 rebounds over his four-year career to join the school's 1,000-point club. He then went to Japan for a short stint playing pro ball before heading to Mobile, Alabama and working at a middle school. Sadly, Rimbert passed away in 2011. Keith Robinson Robinson didn't play as a freshman in Notre Dame, but made a big impact as a sophomore, averaging 10 points and 7 boards. Those numbers would grow to 15-8 and eight as a senior as Robinson led the Irish in scoring. It doesn't look like he was drafted, but he did spend several years playing in the CBA and overseas before hanging him up in 99 after a year in Italy. As of 2015, he was working at an Atlanta psychiatric hospital while also working as a youth coach. Ramil Robinson Robinson's mother moved to Boston when he was a toddler, so he lived with his grandparents in Jamaica. Soon after he turned 10, his grandparents sent him to Boston, hoping to reunite him with his mother, but she didn't want to raise him, so he was taken in by Helen and Lou Ford in 1977. They'd adopt him the next year, and the young guard turned into a high school star. Robinson attended Michigan for his college career, winning a title as a starting guard in 1989. By his senior season, mealtime was averaging 19 points and 6 assists and route to being named second team All-American. Robinson was selected 10th overall by the Hawks in the 1990 draft. He played pro ball for 12 years, splitting his time between 6 different NBA teams and several stints overseas and in the CBA. At his best, Robinson averaged 13 points and 5.5 assists a night for the Hawks, but he was inconsistent across his career. After retiring, he moved to Miami and attempted to become a property developer back in Jamaica, racking up huge debt via various loans. Robinson never paid back the bank and used most of the money to support a luxury lifestyle instead of actually developing property. In 2009, he was arrested, and in 2010, he was convicted on 11 accounts of bank bribery, wire fraud, and several other charges. He was sentenced to six and a half years in prison in order to pay more than a million dollars in fines. If you want to know more, there are plenty of videos that dive deep into this subject. Robinson got out of federal prison in 2016, but I haven't been able to find much about what he's been up to since then. Dwayne Shinsis The 7'1 Shinsis stayed in state to attend Florida. As a Gator, he was a double-digit scorer all four years. However, his time was marred by several disciplinary issues. During his junior season, he heard someone make a rude comment while waiting outside a nightclub. Shinsis stormed after the offender with a tennis racket and was suspended for four games. When he returned, opposing fans threw tennis balls on the court to taunt him. That would backfire when it happened at Vanderbilt. The Gators were down by two with one second left when fans started to throw the tennis balls. The ref called a tech on the Commodores, sending Shinsis to the line. He knocked them both down and scored seven points in OT to knock off Vandy and give Florida their first SEC regular season championship, beating Vanderbilt by one game. As a senior, the team's coach was forced to resign, and Shinsis did not like the new coach. He skipped the first practice and was then involved in a fight at a fraternity. Eventually, the big man quit the team over conflicts with the coach, but statistically is still one of the best players in Florida history. He'd been a major NBA prospect before all the off-the-court issues, 
which dropped him to the 24th pick in the 1990 draft. With the Spurs, Shinsis was almost immediately a disappointment because of persistent injuries, though always a highlight thanks to his flowing mullet. Chronic back issues kept him from ever making a real impact as a pro, though he did play for eight years across five different teams. During that time, he also appeared in Whoopi Goldberg's film Eddie and several local commercials. He retired in 99 and was unfortunately diagnosed with leukemia in 2009. In 2012, the big man sadly passed away after a long bout with cancer. Steven Thompson Thompson moved across the country to attend Syracuse with Coleman. He came off the bench as a freshman before establishing himself as one of the team's starting guards for the last three seasons of his career. The 6'4 guard grew into an 18 points a night scorer, but when undrafted in 1990. Thompson did play 19 NBA games in 92 with the Magic and Kings, but largely spent his career playing in the CBA. He was named the league's Rookie of the Year in 91 and won the scoring title in 92. Thompson left his playing days behind after the 95 season and got into coaching in 2002. As of 2024, he's working as an assistant athletic director at Oregon State. Mark Tillman Tillman played his high school ball in Washington, D.C. before signing with Georgetown for college ball. He started the majority of the team's games that year, averaging 9 points a night. He kept that role as a sophomore and upped that number to nearly 14. However, he lost his starting role to Jaron Jackson in 89, killing his scoring average. Fortunately for him, Jackson graduated and Tillman led the team in scoring as a senior at nearly 20 points a night. He went undrafted in 1990, but joined the Jazz as a free agent. He didn't make the team, instead spending the next several seasons playing in the CBA and overseas, retiring after the 95 season. It looks like he's working in the financial world as of 2024. Scott Williams The 6'10 Williams signed with North Carolina, warning that this is going to get very dark for a second. As a sophomore, Williams' father shot and killed his mother in their garage before shooting himself. Williams continued to play, growing into a 14.5 points and 7 boards a night player as a senior. He went undrafted in 1990, but signed with the Bulls. While he only played sparingly, Williams won three titles in Chicago. In 94, he signed with the Sixers, playing four injury-plagued seasons in Philly. Williams continued to play through the 2005 season as a rotation player for seven different teams. During his final year, he was LeBron's oldest teammate. After wrapping up his career, he worked for several years in broadcasting before starting a short assistant coaching career. He left that behind in 2014 and is seemingly back in broadcasting as of 2024.